Thank you very much. Now, I know everybody wants to uh, watch all the exciting videos uh, that are going to happen after my lecture. The purpose of this lecture is so that you earn all of your CME credits today. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give you a, uh, a quick high-level update in terms of the number of changes that have gone on in the kind of diagnosis, evaluation, and follow-up of thyroid cancer. And a lot of these have actually happened over the past year. So this is what you need to knew, know today before doing the operation and figuring out what operation to do. Kind of the um, classic evaluation of dominant or solitary thyroid nodules, uh, and this is kind of the classic overview that we've been giving our medical students and, and residents, um, is that you first ask them if they've had x-ray therapy to see if they've had a radiated thyroid, and if they do, we generally proceed to total thyroidectomy. Uh, if they say no, we then generally perform a fine needle aspiration for their evaluation. And in what we think today is an oversimplistic algorithm to monitor them, uh, we expect a either benign answer from our cytopathologist, in which case we can generally observe or follow those lesions, the more difficult category, and this is really why uh, there have been a number of changes in the last year in terms of thinking about this, is this so-called indeterminate, suspicious, there are a number of different euphemisms uh, for how to deal with these lesions, some of which are, are follicular neoplasms. And generally, we would then do a diagnostic lobectomy to figure out uh, what it is. We then can get the answer of papillary cancer, in which we have a high degree of confidence that it's cancer. Uh, we are generally doing total thyroidectomies for those patients, but as I'll show you in some of the new guidelines, the uh, answer to this question is actually changing a bit. And again, if we get an inadequate specimen, we don't get enough cells out, the answer is to repeat it. So here are some of the hot topics and the hot changing areas that I think you need to be aware of. Number one, fine needle aspiration. Everybody's using different terms. It's driving the cytologist crazy and it's driving you crazy possibly. And there's been some work on this and I'll review with you trying to shore up a more unified way of discussing this. The question is should I do a lobe or a total? Um, we didn't have the answer 10 years ago. Three years ago we thought we had the answer nice and cleanly and now controversy is creeping back in in terms of the extent of uh, surgery, particularly for small cancers. And then the real question is, should I do a prophylactic node dissection? There's a big literature in this. I don't think we have the final answer yet, but I'll show you what the, what the new guidelines are recommending. Now, your final path report shows papillary microcancers. Now what do you do with the patient? And then does a question need radio, does a patient need radioiodine ablation? These guidelines have uh, changed somewhat as well. So unfortunately, the rest of this talk is going to serve to tell you what you're going to be confused about in the upcoming years as we try to clarify all of this. We've, we've gone from a nice, clean algorithm where we felt very comfortable uh, with what we're doing to a situation where we're starting to ask some basic patient management questions. So there are new guidelines that have been uh, published in a couple different arenas to help us with this. And the first one I want to go through is probably the less clean one or certain one is the uh, new FNA guidelines. Um, it has been published. Uh, you can download this uh, on the internet from the uh, pathology literature. It is termed the Bethesda system. Uh, this was a consensus conference held at the NCI. I guess they didn't want to blame the NCI for all of the mess that they're going to put us with, so they labeled it Bethesda. Uh, you can also buy the book on Amazon. It's $38.95. And uh, what's nice about the book is they've got some very nice photos of all the, all the cytologies if you're into that kind of thing. So you go ahead today and you go ahead and do your ultrasound guided uh, fine needle aspiration. And today, and I'll show you a quote of a cytology report uh, that I got not too long ago that reads, the specimen contains several clusters of follicular cells with colloid and macrophages. Some of the cells may contain nuclear grooves and occasional Herthel cell features. This may represent an adenomatous nodule, follicular lesion, or a possible papillary cancer. The presence of Herthel cells raises the possibility of a Herthel cell cancer. Well, how many are helped with this cytology report? That really just tells me exactly what to do. Um, 
now this is a bit of an exaggeration. I mean, this is a true report. I mean, I quoted this. Um, however, we often get a cytology report where it's not really clear or directs us in terms of what we should do. Um, and this is the real problem. In the older literature, if it says benign, we kind of know what to do. It says cancer, we know what to do. But all of these kind of indeterminate or suspicious categories um, have been kind of muddied in terms of what is really what. And what we would really like to do is map these into the chance of each of these being a cancer, because that then will direct us. And that's exactly what happened in the Bethesda classification system. And so put your seatbelts on. This is, this is what it is. So their, their first category was the non-diagnostic category. The next di that we're fairly comfortable with today, the next was the benign. That is, it's a colloid nodule, more of a hyperplastic lesion than a neoplastic lesion, where for some reason this keeps going backwards. Um, then category three, uh, four, and five kind of lump together or, or try to separate and distinguish these kind of indeterminate suspicious groups. And so they want to try to parse these out into three kind of clearly defined categories. Probably the worst one is this one of atypia of undetermined significance or follicular lesion of undetermined significance. Boy, that sounds real helpful, doesn't it? Um, then they really want to try to put together those that they really think are, are follicular neoplasms, where it's either a follicular adenoma or follicular carcinoma, but really try to put those in a separate category. And then those FNAs that show some malignant features, but not enough to say that it's malignant with a 98, 99% degree of certainty. And what they then have done is that they have mapped these categories into a percent risk of malignancy. So this is where they're trying to help us. Um, now, the other thing that they have done is they are then making recommendations of what we should do. So how many of you like on like a breast mammogram the recommendation of what you should do? How, do you, how many of you like the radiologist telling you what to do? How many are going to enjoy having the pathologist tell you what to do? Either everybody's asleep or everybody agrees with me on this. So the, um, the, the weird thing here is that there are recommendations in terms of what the usual management of these, these uh, should be. The, the one that's kind of weird here um, that I can never sort out is for the atypia to repeat the FNA. Um, there, there was a lot of controversy about this. Uh, and they're becoming radiologists because I guess they're referring to themselves now. The other guideline that you need to be aware of, and this is a long document that you may need to just hack through one day, are the American Thyroid Association guidelines uh, for the management of, of thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer. Free download, thyroid.org. Uh, there are a bunch of other guidelines that have come out um, uh, when, you, when you log on there. Um, there is one on the terminology for doing neck dissections, what all the different classifications are. There's a whole one on medullary cancer, but I'm not going to dwell on those in the limited time. And what I want to try to do is kind of hit some of the, quote, high points or confusing points in these consensus uh, statements. So this is kind of what's, what's new. Um, number one, they are um, making strong recommendations for near total or total thyroidectomy um, in the indeterminate FNA group. Now realize this is kind of pre-Bethesda, so this is kind of the old uh, older way of thinking about this. But if the nodule is greater than four centimeters in size, there's atypia, family history, history of radiation, or bilateral nodules, they're saying uh, be a little bit more aggressive with these patients and move towards a total thyroidectomy. If they feel if you've got a solitary nodule with an indeterminate FNA, okay to do a lobectomy. So a little bit of shift in the more aggressive direction. Now for well-differentiated cancer, that is the result comes back papillary thyroid cancer without any other bizarre types of features, they're saying that a lobectomy is appropriate um, for a less than one centimeter uh, unifocal intrathyroidal lesion with no radiation history and no evidence of involved nodes. <clears throat> so again, this is a little bit of a shift um, from some of the current thinking to a slightly less aggressive stance. And the rationale is that um, although some of these kind of low risk tumors, and I'll talk about that concept in a minute, uh, their risk of recurrence may be slightly higher with less aggressive management. Essentially, nobody dies, and that's the rationale for this discussion. Now, for well-differentiated thyroid cancer, we've always agreed that doing a therapeutic neck dissection, if they're clinically involved nodes, makes total sense. Now, what the new guidelines uh, are addressing in terms of neck dissection are the following things. 
So they are talking about doing a prophylactic neck dissection. So you see no clinically involved nodes for either a T3, and I've stuck in what that means in English, that means a greater than four centimeter lesion, or a T4 lesion, which is any, any size lesion with extrathyroidal invasion. So the uh, recommendations are to consider uh, doing prophylactic neck dissections um, for these larger tumors. They said there's no need for a neck dissection if you have a lesion that's less than two centimeters, the T1s or the T2s between two and four. So anything less than four, they're, they're saying that is not needed. Now obviously if you go in there and clinically you find a node involved, yes, you, it's, you jump into the therapeutic category. Now these are some concepts that uh, I think we generally have been following, but they just clarified a little bit. They're saying uh, that obviously a therapeutic dissection is warranted if you have biopsy-proven metastatic disease, uh, and they're talking about doing a complete neck dissection, not a berry picking. They're talking about doing a completion thyroidectomy for those who, have would, have, who would have had a total thyroidectomy if the diagnosis was apparent preoperatively. So you take out a follicular neoplasm, turns out to be follicular cancer. If you had known that preoperatively through some magic, you would have done a total to begin with. So they're, they're, they're just kind of clarifying those indications. Um, they also address the issue of doing ablation of the remaining normal lobe. So they say it's been used, but really don't know how effective that is in the long term. Now the other thing that they do is they advocate using the AGACC gu uh, staging guidelines. One of the uh, interesting things about thyroid cancer is that there are a number of different staging guidelines. There's the GROOT, the AGES, the AIMS, et cetera, and you'll find papers using different classification systems, and they make an argument that this should be done, you know, although this may not be absolutely totally perfect classification system, uh, for the purpose of standardization and studies, uh, they, they strongly advocate using this staging criteria. Um, obviously, they recommend uh, staging to determine risk stratification, but one of the interesting concepts that, that came out of this is the, is the concept of ongoing risk stratification as you follow these patients over time. Now realize that when we do staging of a tumor, it's done at the time of their surgery. And once you're a stage one, you're always a stage one from, from that point of view. If you develop metastatic disease later on, when you graph the survival of stage one patients, you're still a stage one patient, even though you have subsequently developed more aggressive uh, disease. Um, their concept, um, obviously that staging concept remains, but what they say is let's go ahead and redo the risk stratification of these patients on an ongoing basis to, as time goes on, give the patient a better uh, prognosis prediction as well as directing therapy. And I'll show you what these, uh, <clears throat> these are. So they have a concept of a low risk group of patients. And those are those with no METs, all macroscopic tumor resected, no local invasion, no aggressive histology, no vascular invasion, and after their radioiodine ablation, no uptake outside the thyroid bed. And so this is this, this bucket of patients. And then they have an intermediate group of patients, and those have slightly worse disease in that there is microscopic in, uh, invasion. They either have cervical node metastases or evidence of nodal metastases by RIA uptake outside the central neck, a more aggressive histology or evidence of vascular invasion. And then there's a third category of higher risk patients where there is gross invasion, incomplete tumor resection, distant uh, METs, and the other interesting one are those patients who have evidence of significant disease based on elevated thyroglobulin levels, but are not taking up radioiodine very well. So these tumors biologically are becoming less well differentiated and will be the group of patients often that take up a PET isotope. And so uh, the concept then is as you are managing these patients, to keep thinking about what their risk group is. So you'll be hearing from your endocrinologist, oh, intermediate risk patient, high risk patient, this is what they're, what they're talking about. Radioiodine ablation, I'm gonna run through the post-op management fairly, fairly quickly here. Uh, the, the recent recommendations are more uh, specific. Uh, they recommended for all patients who have no distant METs, gross invasion, or tumors larger than four centimeters. They recommend for selected patients, and this is kind of a gray zone here, uh, obviously, if you've got lymph node METs or the intermediate or high risk group. But realize you can have a patient who kind of has a significant sized lesion, is otherwise low risk, 
and may elect not to ablate those patients. Again, the concept is that they may have a slightly higher recurrence rate down the road, need to follow them, but they, it should have very little, if any, impact on long-term mortality. They do not recommend ablation for lesions smaller than a centimeter and without other higher risk features, and interestingly, not recommended for multifocal cancer if all the foci are less than a centimeter and without other high risk features. There's been a lot of confusing literature about multifocal cancer in some way apply, implying that it's more aggressive in some way. It probably is not, and these recommendations fell into line with that. Post therapy management uh, in terms of uh, thyroid hormone suppression as opposed to everybody getting aggressive uh, suppression, the current recommendations based on risk stratifications is to be a little bit more liberal and allowing these TSH values to creep up and even in the mid-normal range for uh, some low-risk patients. So in summary, and I hope you've earned your CME credits by listening to this today, uh, be aware or either beware, you could read this slide two ways, of the new FNA terminology. It's unclear how widely or rapidly our cytologists are gonna accept it. Cytologists, our group say, oh yes, this is great, we need to do it, but I feel a little uncomfortable changing, you know, moving out of my comfort zone with this. So we'll see how widely this is adopted. ATA guidelines are generally fairly well adopted. I think there was a lot of good evidence-based uh, thinking going into these. I don't think they were jumping on any bandwagons. Uh, remember that these are guidelines and not absolutes. You have to individualize management. Uh, there's still going to be controversy in the area of prophylactic neck dissection of microcancers. We haven't heard the end of this. Uh, and understanding the literature is going to help in communicating with your referring docs and really planning your best surgical approach. And realize that in some cases, you know, we know that we need to do big, aggressive operations. Thank you.